That doesn't mean you can give people prospecting rights who do not have the money or the ability to explore. Okay, now that is settled law, but that is what the department has done over and over and over again. What are the problems facing the mining industry in South Africa? I posed this question to Paul Miller in a recent episode of my podcast, Solutions with David Ansara. What follows is a short extract from this longer conversation. If you would like to watch the full discussion, that's linked in the description below. Enjoy. Why do we see such deep systemic problems in the DMRE? What is going wrong there? Well, first of all, look, corruption. I mean, there's no question there have been enough. There have been enough court cases. Um, corruption, but also politicking and lobbying. They admit themselves um, that they've issued prospecting rights. And you can just see the names of people who've been awarded prospecting rights and mining rights, the connected, the cronies, the, the, the well-established sort of ANC royalty families. You see all of that. That's, that's writ large across the whole mining industry. In fact, the established mining industry has promoted and, and, and you know, abetted that. In that they, you know, you, you know, is your BE partner connected? Well, that should be a red flag, not something you should be proud of. Um, anyway, so, so what we saw was in the way that the Act was drafted, the Act has these objectives, and the objectives are very wide ranging. They, they need to encourage new entrants, they need to transform, they need to promote security of tenure, they need to promote economic development of South Africa. So there are these high level objectives of the act, which, which include economic growth, transformation, some of them actually contradictory to each other. Okay, so, so they're the, the wish list of what the legislature wants the act to achieve. And they're all very noble, right? Um, and they are sometimes contradictory. And then you have the actual requisites within the act of what is required to meet the conditions of being awarded a mining right or a prospecting right. And what has happened is that the officials and the politicians have ma made their own interpretation of how the objectives of the act can be met. And they've applied the objective as overriding the underlying requisite uh, requirements in the act. So for example, in section 17.1a, you can go and read it if you like, which is the, the requirements to be issued a prospecting right. Any party applying for prospecting right is required to demonstrate, in, in fact, required to have funding and the technical ability and skills to optimally apply an approved prospecting works program. So you've got to go and get a scientifically correct prospecting works program. You need to get a professional geologist, draw it up, and then you need to then demonstrate that you've employed people or you yourself have the skills that can apply that scientific program because that's what geology is, um, and that you've got the funds, you've got access to funds to actually implement that plan. Now, that's an absolute requirement. It's not, it's not something that around which there's any discretion. So now we have the, these absolute requirements in, in the body of the act um, that the, the law is now settled. There was the Aquila Resources Court case that went over six years through every level of the courts, all the way up to the Constitutional Court. And it's effectively settled law. I'm saying this as a non-lawyer. Settled law that the requisites, the requirements to be issued a prospecting right, or in that case, a mining right, cannot be overridden by the broad high-level objectives of the Act. Okay, so if the objective of the Act is to open up one of the 14, is to open up the, the industry to new players, that doesn't mean you can give people prospecting rights who do not have the money or the ability to explore. Okay, now that is settled law, but that is what the department has done over and over and over again. So they themselves admit, previous deputy minister said it in a speech, said we've been granting prospecting rights to people who have neither the funds nor the technical ability to implement those prospecting rights. And I won't put my hand up and say, but that was unlawful. Mm. It's unlawful for the minister to grant prospecting rights or mining rights to people who don't meet the basic requirements, regardless of to what extent 
the ob they can argue that the objectives of the act are being met. So we've got this complex set of laws that the, where effectively the officials became activists and they took their own interpretation of how they'd like to achieve the objectives of the act and they rode roughshod over the rest of the act coupled that sort of crony capitalism coupled with a healthy dose of corruption means that at the beginning of last year we had a backlog of over 5,000 prospecting rights mining rights uh, renewals and new applications and uh yeah i mean that's that's where we left now with with this effectively dysfunctional act all right so paul what has been the effect of this on the mining industry in south africa it's complex right because what we what i've been talking about is largely about the future the effect on the future of the industry so the existing incumbents the members of the minerals council of south africa that negotiated the NPRDA back in two th prior to 2002. It's pretty clear what their strategy has been. They've, they had sunk capital in South Africa, literally holes in the ground, that they needed to protect whatever return they could from those assets. So they were prepared to negotiate away anything that they hadn't spent money on, obviously, right? So, where, so they needed to protect their sunk capital and they did that by ne negotiating this grand compromise, which was the MPRDA and the Mining Charter. And the grand compromise had them doing these elaborately structured 26% BEE deals, but they could effectively phase that over, you know, initially it was to 2009 for 15% and then to 2014 for 26%. And then um, the court, courts have eventually found that if you did that, um, you, and you got empowered, you don't have to now do another empowerment deal. So all our existing mining companies, the incumbents, with, are sitting on the existing assets with legal decisions saying that they can continue to hold them. Okay, so, so you've got to put that aside. They're fine. They, they've, they've negotiated this transition process. They've gone through their BE deals. The courts have found it. And quite frankly, nobody in South Africa has ever had a mining right cancelled or confiscated. Those BE provisions are now, that's up to 30% under the latest iteration of the No, it's charter. actually not, right? Because um, the, those, those provisions have been overturned in the, in the, in the mining charter. Okay. So, so, so there is no requirement. So the, the law is now settled. If you did a BE deal, you don't have to redo it, okay? Unless, of course, they change the law, right? And if you're applying for a new mining right, you might have to do 26 or 30%, right? But... What, my point's different. If you have in your hand a prospecting right, I mean a mining right, and you went through that process, in other words, you held it back in 2002, if you were a Glencore or Anglo-American or any one of the large companies, Kumba Iron Ore in the Northern Cape, if you held the mining right, you went through that transition process, you did your BE deal, it might have unwound, it might not, you find today on your existing mine Okay, but you're sure as anything not going to go and take a chance exploring for new resources in South Africa. And now that's where the conundrum comes in because that was 20 years ago, right? Now mines don't last forever. And South Africa is extraordinarily blessed with incredible long life mines. And this idea exists somehow that these mines are going to last forever, but they're not. Many of our mines have less, about 12 years left. Right. And in fact, when I've been addressing audiences of geologists, gray haired geologists, and I say, how many mines are still going to be operating in 20 years? And they start counting them and everyone can think of some. Right. Venetia will be operating and, you know, um, South Deep will be operating and you can go through which mines, but people run out of mines before they run out of fingers. OK, so the nature of mining is that you've got to constantly fill the pipeline of projects by exploring for mines. But our incumbent miners have given up on South Africa. They've done everything they can to protect the returns on their sunk capital, and they do nothing outside of their, those mines. It, the regulatory, it's too difficult for them. So what do we do? We decide, we recognize that people have been complaining and pointing this out for, for I've been doing it for over a decade, saying, 
We need to fill our pipeline of new projects and we can only do that by exploring. So now finally the state has come out with an exploration strategy. They recognize it as a problem, but they negotiated that exploration strategy with the very people who haven't been exploring for the last 20 years. Big mining companies are not good at exploration. It's two different businesses. Thanks for watching. Let's hand over to you, our viewers. Why do you think the mining industry is struggling to survive? Leave your thoughts down in the comment section below. Also, if you would like to watch the full discussion with Paul Miller, that's linked over here. You can also subscribe to my other channel, that's linked over here. My name is David Ansara. Until next time, take care.